Welcome to The Authority File, the podcast where you'll hear conversations with academic librarians, technologists, researchers, and authors whose work is laying the foundation for higher education's future. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. If you're new to The Authority File, you can listen to and find previous episodes on all of the major podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and on our website, choice360.org. My guest for this series is Dr. Deanna Reeder. Dr. Reeder is a Cree Métis literature scholar. Her latest book is called Autobiography as Indigenous Intellectual Tradition, Cree and Métis Achamisawina, published by Wilfrid Laurier University Press. Dr. Reeder has had an enormous impact on the development and growth of Indigenous literature studies in Canada. She's the current chair of the Department of Indigenous Studies at Simon Fraser University. Since 2007, she's helped build courses and curriculum at Simon Fraser to establish Indigenous studies as a separate discipline from post-colonial studies and Canadian literature. She served as series editor for Indigenous Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University Press from 2010 to 2021, developed workshops on how to teach Indigenous literatures, helped establish the Indigenous Literary Studies Association, co-founded the Indigenous Editors Association, and co-chairs the Indigenous Voices Awards, an awards program for Indigenous writers. I mention all of this because the study of Indigenous literature as a distinct discipline that brings with it specific methods of instruction and learning is a comparatively recent undertaking. It was only in 2001 when Dr. Reeder began her doctoral work that the field began to shift and orient itself toward a more authentic and more broadly recognized scholarly undertaking. In this series, which is provided with support from Wilfrid Laurier University Press, Dr. Reeder and I have been discussing her research background, her new book, The Growth of Indigenous Literature Studies, and her role in its development. In this fourth and final episode, we talk about the growing archive of Indigenous writing up to 1992 called The People and the Text. Dr. Reeder will also talk about the next important steps for continuing to evolve and grow the field of Indigenous literature studies. Okay, so let's let's talk about the archive. Uh, it's called the People and the Text, um, and it's an archive of Indigenous writing up to 1992. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the purpose of the archive and 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 why it is needed. So we um, we have a database that it is has not yet successfully. Um, included every single thing written by Indigenous writers up till 1992, but we've got a really good start and we're, we continue to work on it every year. But I, we focused on um, work that was written up till 1992 because most people sort of think that's when Native writing came onto the scene. I mean, if you think about the Oxford hand, um, Handbook or the Oxford Anthology of Native Literatures in English, I think is what it's called, um, that was first put out by Terry Goldie and Daniel David Moses, um, that whenever you get a, a body of literature that's under a, you know, a, an Oxford imprint, for example, that sort of <laughs> says, okay, university teaching, this is, you know, it can, it can do that. And up to that right. point, there, there wasn't that, that didn't exist. And yet there were so many writers that, that did mm. exist and so much um, work. And so we've included anybody who published before that date uh, and, and, um, and trying to go back as far as we can. In fact, one of our research partners, Susan Glover, is, is um, doing great work on Anishinaabe writing from the um, 17th and 18th centuries as well as the 19th. So she's, she's um, an amazing archival researcher, and I think that's been really important. But we want to be a, a resource for for the, for those sort of very specialized kinds of pieces of writing, but we also just uh, for easy access for some foundational work. So yeah. one of the things that um, Thetis Press, by the way, is the not just the oldest Indigenous publishing house in Canada, is the oldest Indigenous publishing house in the world. And it, it was started in 1980. And they had put out, in conjunction with the Anaukin School of Writing that, that's on the Penticton Indian Band, they'd put out an, a literary journal from about 1990 to about 2004, 2003. And they've 
um, occasionally put out another one called, but this anthology is called Gatherings. And initially this, um, the Gatherings um, journal had, um, they, they had lost their digital copies. And so we had said that we had the capacity to scan it back for them. And Greg had suggested that we put it up online so that the authors who'd published in, in this journal would be able to access it. And now we even have searchable PDFs on our website that, um, so that teachers can uh, you know, use it for assignments. So if you want to see what people are writing about or if you want to, it's a searchable PDF. So I had my students try to create their own anthologies drawing on this corpus of work. So it's a way of, of uh, A, for the record, having, um, you know, a, a, a comprehensive list of work that has been done, but also materials that the, that researchers and profs can use right now. And I think that's been really useful. And I, I, um, we have lots of ambitions to, to keep going. Sure. So it, it, it's, uh, it contains uh, scholarly content. Does it contain any full text of, of the literature itself or? Not, not comprehend, not, I mean, we follow cop Canadian copyright law. And so we do right, have right. The, the permission by um, Thetis for, for gatherings. And we've mm. um, reached out to as many authors as well, just to make sure that they, they, know, um, they know this. But we also have uh, Hartmut Lutz was a German scholar who in the late 80s went around interviewing a whole batch of Indigenous writers, people that most Canadian scholars had never talked to. And those um, recordings are also available online on, on, on our website. We also have Christine Bold found some uh, vaudevillian scripts by a Mohawk writer, and mm -hmm. uh, Seneca, actually. And um, she asked the community, uh, you know, I found this these plays in the British library, library do you what do you want me to do with them next? And they wanted them to be available for the next generation to be able to read. And so she's, get, we've included that on the website and that kind of thing. So right now, um, mm -hmm. we had initially thought that people in the text would do this very slow, systematic scan of archives across Canada. And instead we keep like jumping across bags of rubies in diamonds. You know, and, <laughs> and so we, we've been attending to those. But we, we do want to continue on to be more systematic because there's a lot a, a lot of material out there that just isn't accessible. Right. Excellent. So you want to. So the goal then is as you move forward to kind of create a sort of centralized, I guess, repository of of all of these resources. So if we don't have the actual um, scans available uh, on the website. I mean, we personally have them, but we don't necessarily have them pu published on the website. Right. At least there's signposts to where you can get Pointing. them. And sometimes right. the signpost is to us, uh, you know, so we have also mm -hmm. played that role. Excellent. And then generally, more generally, how does the uh, field of Indigenous literary studies continue to evolve? I mean, what are, what are some, you know, I guess some of the m more important next steps? Um, for the field? I think we really have to think about pedagogy. So I've been working with my colleague, Michelle Kapal, and um, we, we guest edited a recent uh, issue of Studies in American Indian Literature. It'll be mm -hmm. coming out sometime early fall, probably, and have a, a, a group of amazing profs in the field who have a lot of experience teaching. We, if we're really going to have Indigenous literatures studied in the university, we need a lot more people to be able to teach it. And they, you know, and so we really have to expand that base. Right now, it's funny that everything takes its own rhythm. I know that students are fed up with never having had an Indigenous prof, and that I've heard in several places kind of students rallying that there must be an Indigenous person hired, and I'm all for that. I've been done a lot to support that. But we cannot expand if we only focus on growing Indigenous um, um, professoriate. You know, we really need to have every lit scholar capable, you know, in the same way that you would expect a lit scholar um, to be capable in teaching um, Canadian lit, you'd have mm -hmm. to do the same in, um, you'd need the same kind of growth. And I, 
So, I mean, I think that there's a little bit of um, struggle right now, I think, about getting the resources and the leadership to be able to really make that kind of change. But I, 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 I'm speaking only for myself and for nothing that's gotten in place just yet. I just don't know how useful a typical um, master's or PhD is in, in, in making any kind of change if you're still going to have to spend the majority of the time focusing on non-Indigenous lit. Right. Yeah. It, you know, right. and so, uh, you know, we we have to maybe have programs that are all focused uh, um, because even now the average um, master's student has really maybe only taken two or three courses if they're lucky, you know, and mm. many have taken none, and that's twenty twenty two. Like how how much longer is it going to be like this? And so we really have to be um, radically changing uh, syllabi, you know, curriculum. Uh, you know, and um, and to ways of teaching, because of course it's not simply changing the books out; it's also changing the approaches. And and I think the that method. that's yeah. been a big part of the conversation too. Yeah, yeah. Um, earlier, you mentioned um, sort of this new generation of Indigenous authors um, coming out in the past decade or so. Um, you know, especially seen with recent awards and conferences. Um, have you? I'm just curious if you've noticed, um, you know, any impact from this cohort of authors yet on on the field in general or the literature in terms of style or genre or, um, you know, anything that you might be able to talk about? I I mean, there's so many things that have happened that I think have changed. In 2015, probably the go-to person would have been Joseph Boyden. Everybody wanted mm. to talk about Indigenous literature and maybe a generation before him would have been uh, Thompson Highway. We still talk to Thompson Highway, obviously, but, you know, Tom King. But, I mean, it, it, it always is one person at a time and one expert at a time to do everything. Now I think that that has really widened. Um, okay. Also, uh, uh, um, sort of two-spirit writing is, um, is coincided with, I think, the general discussion out in the world about, um, you know, LGBTQ to, um, mm-hmm. to spirit, uh, um, rights and, and kind of the, I think that just as a real questioning of, you know, the kind of very limited categories we used to have for, you know, sexuality and gender, you know, that kind of has exploded. So I think that's, that's easily mirrored in indigenous writing. Um, the real interest in speculative fiction, you know, in imagining a future that doesn't have to resonate with sort of cowboys and Indians sort of uh, uh, you know, pop fiction images, you know, instead yeah. imagining a new world um, is easily seen. And so you think about Meryl Thieves, but you can even think of Dennis Goulet's Night Riders, you know, Night Raiders, pardon me, the film that's burning up all over, you know, and at, yeah. including the Cannes Festival, you know, I think is... Uh, all indicates uh, uh, incredible energy and um, vitality. So the the whole field just feels um, like just people are writing their first of what you can tell will be many books. And that's really mm-hmm. exciting. And then, of course, um, I mean, poetics has been um, been so important because I think something like Jordan Abel's Niska, um, Nishka, pardon me, and... Um, you know, uh, even Smokey Sumac's poems that were originally written on, you know, for Facebook posts, uh, you know, are, I think, been so widely taken up. And then finally, autobiography. Like, really? Yeah. How many Indigenous stories have been out there and I think are being read, you know, widely? And that's mm-hmm. really exciting. Yeah, excellent. I'm curious if you could talk about how the discipline looks more broadly across Canadian higher education. Um, you know, you've obviously been doing a lot of work, um, you know, where you are currently. And, and, you know, I'm wondering how what you're doing fits in with what others are doing across the country. Um, you know, are, are you seeing results from the work um, you've put into the field so far? And, um, and then also, I mean, are you seeing any parallels with what's being done in American higher education as well? I think the main change that we're all hoping for and that we're seeing is just the rise in, in basic understandings. So when I, even in 2010, 
if I stood in front of a group of first year students or a group of grad students and I asked them, what are the categories of, uh, what are the three categories as listed in the Constitution of Canada of Aboriginal peoples? I, so, you know, yeah. there's Aboriginal peoples is, the, is, is, is in the Constitution of Canada, rights are protected um, for three particular groups. And the average master's student, the average undergrad had no idea what the answer is. And now, of course, everybody, you know, Indian or First Nations, um, Inuit and Métis, right? That, mm -hmm. that basic uh, um, appreciation has helped open up um, an understanding of the different histories and different experiences with the state and, and all that kind of thing. So, I mean, I, 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 that will only get bigger as people continue with land acknowledgements and actually think, oh, gee, what it, where am I living? And what is, <laughs> what's the history of treaties in this particular part of the world? And who were the people who were before and are still mm -hmm. here or, or not, if, depending on that history? And so that, all those things are, are making changes. But man, I'm starting to despair. Like, this is taking too long. Come on, okay. you know, really, yeah. uh, you know, what, what, you know, our, I, I mean, I, one of the, a lot of Indigenous scholars start late, you know, in, in, in a higher education just to get their lives to a point where they can go. So, I mean, I'm, my kids are all now grown and I'm now about to have my second sabbatical, you know, so I've been doing this for 14 years and, and I look back to maybe another decade and I think, are, are we going to ever get to the point where we can throw out the, the uh, previous um, expectations of an English degree and actually train um, scholars who can be able to even distinguish between, you know, writing styles from different parts, uh, you know, uh, uh, from different territories, you know, and mm -hmm. never mind all the other ramifications. So I, I think that there's a lot that's happening and I'm happy for that, but I do feel a little bit like um, we've also the, Truth and Reconciliation Commission did open up people's minds and, uh, and and opened up institutions to kind of appreciate the value of indigenization and decolonization. But will that still be here, that appetite and commitment still be there here 10 years from now? What can we do really make hay while well, the sun shines? And I'm not sure exactly the right answer just yet, but I know that I and my colleagues are working on it. Yeah. Great. Well, excellent. That's all the time we have for Deanna. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you very much. You just heard from Dr. Deanna Reeder. Dr. Reeder is the current chair of the Department of Indigenous Studies at Simon Fraser University and author of Autobiography as Indigenous Intellectual Tradition, Cree and Métis Achamisawina, published by Wilfrid Laurier University Press. This series is brought to you with support from Wilfrid Laurier University Press. As always, underwriting opportunities for the Authority File podcast are directed by Choices Advertising Manager Pam Marino, and all of our episodes are produced and edited by Choices Digital Media Producer Sabrina Kofer, with support from Digital Media Assistant Ashley Roy. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.